Good morning. My name is Stephen Capaldo from Mercad Unity Ministries in New York City. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, we've just been sitting around uh, preparing for the message, listening to some uh, some Christmas music. Maybe that's more of a girl thing. I don't know, but we're both enjoying it. Uh, th anyway, the uh, thank you for watching. And today uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, in in both messages. I'm going to be talking about the Word of God and. Uh, science, and I'll be uh, talking about uh, a small book which I actually can recommend very much by Ray Comfort, who you may, you may have known if you've, uh, um, well, you may know him different ways. He's, he has appeared on uh, TBN and, uh, and you know, some areas of Christian TV where I've seen him. Uh, and he has written a book, Scientific Facts in the Bible, A Hundred Reasons to Believe the Bible is Supernatural in Origin. So in the first message, I would just touch on one of the chapters a bit and just kind of hit the high points of, you know, where science and the Bible seem to coincide, and then take that to Job 38 in the second message and, and uh, see how those, those things are reflected in Job 38. But before we begin, as usual, we would like to thank you, Father, for everything you do for us, and thank you for everything you have uh, allowed for us and given to us and the prosperity in our lives. Uh, we pray for the upcoming days and weeks and the holiday season. We pray for prosperity. We pray for he healing, family healing, and workplace healing, and other forms of healing, and we ask especially uh, in this season that you be with Pastor Francis and his family and his uh, his congregations, and especially the parents in the congregation that have just lost their their child. Uh, we pray that you help them understand uh, or reach the place of acceptance, even though we know that your thoughts are not our thoughts, Father, and your ways are not our ways. And so perhaps we don't have perfect understanding of such tragedies at, uh, at this time. Uh, time, but uh, through a study of the Word and prayer and, and meditation and revelation, we can at least better understand how certain things, how everything fits together in your plan. And be with us in the next uh, days and weeks, and um, help us walk uh, in your ways, and help us be salt and light to a dying world in this uh, ex extremely, extremely sick world that we're living in right now. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, Ray Comfort, as I was saying, it's, um, I, I don't know if he pastors a church. He, ha he has a ministry. He's, I believe, from New Zealand, and I believe, actually, he is uh, from a Jewish family, and he became a born-again believer a number of years ago and uh, has, started, uh, uh, has started a ministry. And, and what, I, what I particularly um, uh, enjoyed was running into this book because uh, many times in witnessing you run against uh, you run up against people who have you know they have all the answers you know they've studied books they've studied science they've studied this they've studied that and uh, you know the Bible to them is just a, just a fairy tale it doesn't it doesn't occur to people that there are definitely clues in the Bible of how God created you know not not just that he created but how he created and you know you could you, you could study that and perhaps you could even have further revelation you know that's uh, from just from prayer in your own individual relationship with the holy spirit but god does go beyond saying simply that he created he does talk about uh the different parts of his creation and we'll look at the book of job a little bit later uh, to see that uh, a little bit. Uh, and you, you can also see that uh, as he discusses his physical creation, there are also spiritual implications, because when he talks about having created light and having created the day, well, there's the light and there's the darkness, so uh, in both a natural sense and a spiritual sense. So really, this gets back to the fact that the, the, this book, the Bible, that the Scripture, the Word of God, really does uh, t tell it really does tell us, um, you know, things that... that that, that we need for our natural lives on planet Earth, but there is also that the spiritual level. So you can understand the book both ways. You can understand it as uh, revelation regarding natural things, and you can understand it as revelation regarding spiritual things. So uh, we'll get onto that Job 38 uh, a little bit later in the next message. And right, right now, I'll just uh, I'll just present them some things from Chapter One of Ray Comfort's book. Uh, this chapter is called Science and the Bible, and he's just got it. He's got it divided into. I don't know, eight or ten different segments, twelve different segments maybe, that that show that actually provide scriptural evidence that God is talking about certain scientific principles. For example, the Bible and Earth's free float in space. That that uh, you know there was a time when people believed that the Earth was on a, a large animal or a giant of some kind. That the Earth was actually resting on some some other type of creation that God created man and but God created animals for example and that the earth was resting on an animal around 1500 BC 
Uh, the Bible, however, speaks of the Earth's free float in space. You know that it's not it's not suspended, by, up, you know, held up by strings or anything. But that but that God suspended uh, the Earth and the planets in space. He hangs the Earth upon nothing. Job twenty six seven says, which means the Earth is there and it doesn't it, it doesn't fall anywhere. It does it does rotate because God has provided for ro rotation and revolution of the earth, but it's not suspended by strings, it's not lying on anything, it's not upheld by anything except the power of God. God set it there, and there it is. Science didn't discover that the earth hangs upon nothing until 1650, and of course, you know, uh, when man d discovered that, you know, God ordained all of the, or, or created, established science for, for man to discover and use during the course of human history. When man discovers something, man glorifies man, generally. But uh, really, this, uh, this idea that uh, the earth was uh, free-floating in space, this is in the Bible, you know, it was well before 1650 when man discovered it. And then the scriptures speak of an invisible structure. In other words, that you know all of matter is created of atoms, and atoms are created of molecules. Only in recent years has science discovered that everything we see is composed of things that we cannot see, which is an amazing thing. You know, I'm staring at a camera right now. Well, that camera actually is a formation of different atoms and, and molecules, which I cannot see individually, but I see a camera. And, and this is really how. How, how matter works, and you know, I'm, uh, as you can tell, I'm far from an expert on that. But this is what this is what the sense of that verse is in uh, Hebrews 11:3, written 2,000 years ago. Scripture tells us that the things which are seen, like this camera I'm looking at, were not made of things which do appear. So everything is made of the the visible is made of the invisible. So the the visible is all made up of matter, which is made up of atoms. You can't see an atom; it's it's invisible to the naked eye. Molecules are part of atoms, even more invisible to the naked eye, if you can be more invisible. So, the, uh, just to make the point that the Bible says this. So when Christians talk about this, it isn't something that we, that we made up, or when man discovered it, it's, they're discovering something that was already ordained and established by God, and that God put there to be discovered. The Bible reveals that the earth is round. The scriptures tell us that the earth is round. It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth. So God is in control. Jesus Christ controls history, controls the universe. You know, we've learned it in different, uh, in different ways. Isaiah 40, 22. And interestingly enough, if you go back to the original language, which uh, sometimes is an interesting thing to do, I've, I've taught about the original languages. He Hebrew is the number one uh, original inspired language of the word of God. There's no question about that. Uh, God can certainly give you revelation in your language if you do have an opportunity to learn some Hebrew or some Aramaic or some Greek, you know, as, as being the, the earliest languages of the Bible, and Hebrew is certainly the number one inspired language of the Bible. It, it can only add to your development and add to your growth. It's not, it's not a bad thing. The word translated circle here is the Hebrew word chug, which is also translated circuit or compass, depending on the context. So the, the, that the Hebrew word that's used here definitely denotes roundness of the earth. Um, it indicates something spherical, rounded, or arched, not something that is flat or square. And uh, it is to be noted that the book of Isaiah was written sometime between 740 and 680 BC, so you know, roughly more or less 700 BC, at least 300 years before Aristotle suggested in his book on the heavens that the earth might be round. And another 2,000 years later, at a time when science believed that the earth was flat, that the scriptures inspired Christopher Columbus, a believer in Jesus Christ, to sail around the world and to discover that the earth was round. The Bible and the science of oceanography, and that, and you know, and you probably recall if you have read anything about Christopher Columbus before I go on to oceanography, is that... Um, you know, he, he was ridiculed for holding such a thought. You know, that's my recollection of things that I've, I remember of, uh, of Christopher Columbus. Uh, not, not, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't live when he lived, but I'm reading things from Christopher Columbus. Uh, that he, he was really ridiculed and, and mocked and made fun of for, for thinking that the earth was uh, round, believing that the earth was round, because science said that the earth was flat. You know, if science says something, we're supposed to believe it. If science says that the earth is getting warmer and warmer and warmer, we're supposed to believe it. And nobody is supposed to question science. And but really what arrogant man is saying, don't question arrogant man. And certainly don't do it with a 
sketchy book like the Bible, right? You know, this is what science wants you to believe, is that, uh, is that the, the, the Bible doesn't really lay the foundation for all of these things. Anything that man has accomplished, we're nothing without the grace of God. And anything that we've accomplished has been accomplished through the grace of God, including the great discoveries of science. Science was, dis was established by God for man to, 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 to use and, and to find and to use, basically, during human history, I think is the simplest way to put it. And we should be grateful to God that he has made that possible. Because of science, we have all kinds of discoveries. And, you know, in many parts of the world, we live materially in, uh, you know, in, in very comfortable circumstances. Much of the world does not. But in our part of the world, for example, people are generally living in, in uh, you know, very, uh, very comfortable uh, material circumstances because of, because of developments of science. And, and who made it possible for man to discover and use science? That's God. You go back. You can go back only so far, and then you can't explain anything. Well, what they they, they call it uh, the, the the first cause or the uncaused cause or the cause that cannot be explained. How you, you can't explain, you know, where everything came came from unless there was a God who has always existed. I mean, there isn't really any any rational explanation. You can only go back so far in the science. And privately, many scientists apparently would would confirm that, even though they may have spoken publicly to say that uh, that science uh, proves there is no God. The Bible and the Science of Oceanography. There was a fellow named Matthew Morey, 1806 to 1873, he lived in the 19th century, is considered the father of oceanography, study of the seas and oceans. He noticed the expression paths of the sea in Psalm 8.8, written 2,800 years ago, and said, if God said there are paths in the sea, I'm going to find them. So this is another, another guy like Christopher Columbus. You know, God says it's round, I'm going to prove it's round. So Matthew Murray said, I'm going to prove there are paths in the sea. Murray then took God at his word and went looking for these paths, and we are indebted to his discovery of the warm and cold continental currents. So these paths of the sea was God's way of dropping that hint that there are different there are different currents. Some of them are warmer, some of them are colder, of course, but there are different currents underneath. You know, you look at uh, the, the, the top of these currents, warm and cold. His book on oceanography remains a basic text on the subject and is still used in universities. And of course, depending on what type of current it is, it will feed different, uh, different uh, forms of life uh, in, in the ocean. The Bible and radio waves. God asked Job a very strange question in 1500 BC. He said to Job, can you send lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. That's in Job 38, 35. I'll be going on to Job 38 uh, later on. Here we are. This appears to be a scientifically ridiculous statement that light can be sent and then manifest itself in speech. But did you know that all electromagnetic radiation from radio waves to x-rays travels at the speed of light? This is why you can have instantaneous wireless communication with someone on the other side of the earth. And you see now that because of uh, technology uh, perfections in this area, you've got the whole wireless system, the, the World Wide Web, and you really, you've got, you've got uh, faster and faster communication around the globe through this, this basically wireless system, this, uh, this uh, wireless capability that was ordained by what God has created. The fact that light could be sent and then manifest itself in speech wasn't discovered by science until 1864, 3,300 years later, when British scientist James Clerk Maxwell suggested that electricity and light waves were two forms of the same thing. And then the Bible and entropy. Entropy is another word for confusion or disorder. Um, and, and entropy usually suggests that something is clear and then it becomes confused, or something is in order and then progressively it becomes disordered. Uh, like the state of the world, you know, it seems fairly orderly and now it seems much more chaotic. And so you could say then that it is in a state of progressive entropy. The Bible and entropy, three different places in the Bible, Isaiah 51, 6, Psalm 102, 25 and 26, and Hebrews 1, 11. These three places indicate that the earth is wearing out. This is what the second law of thermodynamics, the law of increasing entropy, states, that in all physical processes, every ordered system over time tends to become more disordered. Because, uh, well, these, these systems become more disordered and, and uh, probably it has to do with man's interference in them. That's a, that's a, very, good, uh, a very good bet. Everything is running down and wearing out as energy is becoming less and less available for use. So the old is leaving, the new will be coming in. 
by the grace of God. That means the universe will eventually wear out, or the universe or this, this particular world, will eventually wear out to the extent that, in theory, there will be a heat death and therefore no more energy available for use. This wasn't discovered by science until recently, but the Bible states it in concise terms. So that's the, the, the Bible and entropy. The Bible and the water cycle. And water, you know, has many symbols. You know, we've had discussions and teaching about baptism and should you be water baptized or not water baptized. And if you're, if you're truly uh, a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, he was water baptized. So obviously that was something important to him. Is it, is it essential for eternal life? No, it is not. It is something that Jesus did as a witness. And water is, biblically, it is, it is a symbol of life. So I think then the, the issue of baptism, it's, it, you know, once, once you, have, uh, you, you have believed in Jesus Christ, then that's a very good witness, you know, to be water baptized. But that, that's not really our point here. The Bible and the water cycle, the scriptures inform us, all the rivers run into the sea. And they do. The rivers run down through mountains and valleys, etc. And you know, you look at look at a map of the U.S. and watch the rivers. You know, they used they start. Yeah, that's just the way it is. That's the way God created the earth. They start from higher places and go into lower places, flow, flow into the sea. Yet the sea is not full. So, in other words, the earth and the countries that cover the earth now they, they haven't been uh, they, they haven't been uh, submerged you know they haven't been put completely underwater there are some smaller ones in the Pacific that are you know the the, the 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 water is rising in those smaller places that are right on the sea and and uh, you know there is some danger in some of those countries but the sea is not full it, it hasn't completely uh, overtaken the earth Unto the place from whence the rivers come, there they return again, Ecclesiastes 1, 7. This statement alone may not seem profound, but when considered with other biblical passages, it becomes all the more remarkable. For example, and here's the example Ray Comfort gives, the Mississippi River dumps approximately 518 billion gallons, billion gallons of water every 24 hours into the Gulf of Mexico. Where does all that water go? And that's just one of thousands of rivers. The answer lies in the hydrologic cycle, so well brought out in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 11.3 states that if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Look at the Bible's concise words in Amos 9.6. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the face of the earth. The idea of a complete water cycle of the rain coming down and then the rivers flowing into the sea. That complete water cycle was not fully understood by science until the 17th century, however, more than 2,000 years prior to the discoveries of Pierre Perrault, Edme Mariot, Edmund Halley, and others, the scriptures clearly spoke of a water cycle. The Bible and the first law of thermodynamics, the second one being the law, the law of increasing entropy that I just mentioned, the first law of thermodynamics, the scriptures say, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, in Genesis 2.1. The original Hebrew uses the past definite tense for the verb finished, indicating an action completed in the past, never again to occur. The creation was finished once and for all. That is exactly what the first law of thermodynamics says. So this was a law that was so-called created by man, but basically it was a created by God and it was, it was discovered by man. The, this law, often referred to as the law of the conservation of energy and or mass, states that neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed. So once God has created something, God does not destroy something. Uh, and that's what this natural law says, that man says that man discovered, but basically God established it. It was because of this law that Sir Fred Hoyle's steady state or continuous creation theory was discarded. Hoyle stated that at points in the universe called eartrons, matter or energy was constantly being created. But the first law states just the opposite. Indeed, there is no creation going on today. It is finished exactly as the Bible states. Now, things happen. That's not what the Bible is saying. But the, the, the actual creation of the universe was, was done once. And... And, and that's it. It's up. It's up to God to dispose dispose of it as he as he wishes. But man doesn't create or destroy in the way that God does. Man discovers things, does things all by the grace of God. But the Creator is the Lord God of the universe. The Bible and ship dimensions in Genesis six. God gave no other dimensions of the one point five million cubic foot ark he was to build. In 1609, at a place called Horn in Holland, a ship was built after that same pattern. Uh, 
revolutionizing shipbuilding. By 1900, every large ship on the high seas was inclined toward the proportions of the Ark, verified by Lloyd's Register of Shipping in the World Almanac. So that's that's a little uh, interesting uh, insight, is that this this Ark, which is in the Hebrew, is actually referred to as a box, but that design of a ship was something which man picked up later and copied, imitated, because it was found to be... Um, it was found to be a very good ship to go on the high seas. The Bible and weather, meteorological laws. The scripture describes a cycle of air currents 2,000 years before scientists discovered them. The water currents underneath the ocean, and now these are the air currents. The wind goes toward the south and turns about unto the north. It whirls about continually, and the wind returns again according to its his circuits, Ecclesiastes 1.6. We now know that the air around the earth turns in huge circles, clockwise in one hemisphere and counterclockwise in the other hemisphere. And now we know that, but this is really, this is really stated in, in the Bible, if you read it carefully and closely. The wind goes toward the south and turns about unto the north. It whirls about continually, and the wind returns again according to his, to his circuit. So around one way, around the other way. So, uh, the Bible and science in antiquity, in the old days, and in what is called the Dark Ages, men did not know what they now know about humanity and the cosmos. They did not know the lock, but they possessed the key, which is God. Now many have excellent descriptions of the lock, but they have lost the key. The proper solution is union between religion and science. And that's the faith in science, uh, and that, that really to understand that you know God is God really is the author of all things. God created science for the uh, discovery and use of man during human history. I mean that would be the, the balanced way of looking at it. The fact is that as science advances, it discovers what was said thousands of years ago in the Bible, and this came from Richard, Richard Wormbrand, Proofs of God's Existence. So that, that's actually would be probably a very good reference book, Richard Wormbrand, Proofs of God's Existence. So I'll stop there for the introduction, and we'll move on to Job 38 in the second message. Uh, before we do that, we'll just close with the uh, uh, John 3.16, so that we can just once again remember the, the Lord God, our Creator, as embodied in Jesus Christ, and, and how that applies to our daily lives and our daily witnessing. And uh, as you know, I do it in different languages, uh, not just to do it in different languages, but so that you know it doesn't matter what language this message is presented in. It's eternal, it's of God, and it's true. So, John 3.16, Ибо так возлюбил Бог мир, что отдал Сына Своего Единородного, дабы всякий, верующий в Него, не погиб, но имел жизнь вечную. Porque, de tal manera, amo Dios al mundo, que ha dado a su Hijo unicénito, para que todo aquel que en él cree, no se pierda, mas tenga vida eterna. Car Dieu a tant aimé le monde qu'il a donné son Fils unique, afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse point, mais qu'il ait la vie éternelle. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, uniquely born Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not die, but would have eternal life. And we just thank you again, Father, for this day and this opportunity to worship you and, and to have people listening, and, and please bless the people listening and so that they can be a blessing to others and that we can all go forward in this ministry and be a, a blessing and, and salt and uh, light in a dying world. We thank you for the prosperity and the gifts you give us every day, and we uh, bless them to the service of yourself and your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of your Spirit, for you are Spirit, Lord God. Uh, we thank you for all you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Betsy.